teach someone how to tackle before you give them a helmet. Learn how to get the full range of motion and actually strengthen your neck. There's like a multi-faceted improvement that you'll feel in both performance and symptoms when, you, when you're training the, the right region. What's up guys, welcome to the show and thank you for joining me. So today I sit down with a special guest, Scott Dickinson, the doctor of physical therapy. And I brought Scott on the show because he has created a device for something that we do not talk about enough in the health and fitness world or the physical therapy world, and that's talking about the neck. And he has designed a program called Next Level, a specific device trained to prevent and treat neck pain and strengthen the neck as well, okay? It's something that we don't talk about as much in strength and conditioning of the work that we can do with the neck. And we dove into why that is, how he created this device and the success that he's seeing on all different fronts from physical therapy as well as into professional sports teams. So if you wanna check more out on something that we don't talk about enough, you are going to get a lot of value out of this. Scott was an absolute joy to chat with and the work that he is doing specifically for this region is absolutely incredible. So enjoy the show. We'll get right to it. I'll see you on the inside. And we're back. Scott, thanks for taking the time. I'm really excited to chat about this. This is a topic that has been uh, you know, on my mind for a long time to chat with. So thanks so much for joining me, man. It's an honor. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's gonna be good. Anybody that Antonio tells me to reach out to, I just net, I just jump on it right away. So we got a mutual friend in Antonio Scalante. So Antonio, shout out for making this happen. And um, we're gonna kick this off really with with talking about the neck. So we'll get right into it, okay? Please. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, the program that you built and um, in this invention next level, I mean, we'll get into the details behind it. But as I said, the the neck is something that I don't think in strength and conditioning, we talk about enough, you know, maybe in like professional sports or in clinical settings we do, but really even getting into the personal training world and even working with general population, it's all about, you know, chest down, you know, do what we do a million things for knee prevention and knee repair, but there's really not that much going on with the neck. And you've you know built this program that is seems fascinating that you're working with, but to get into it, Scott, like, what was it about, like, what is the origin story behind how you got into this world of physical therapy, which eventually got you into wanting to create this event invention specifically for the neck? Yeah, sure. So uh, getting into the world of PT and sports medicine uh, was via an injury, which is so often the case for PTs and other athletic trainers. Uh, you come down with an injury in high school, you get exposed to the field doing your rehab. I happened to get uh, some surgery on my ankle. I did nine months of PT in a clinic, met a couple great guys that uh, interested me in the, in the field. I hadn't been exposed to it before. I knew I liked the body. I liked science and I was an athlete at the time. And so it was a nice fit for me as a, as a physical therapist. You know, you get to work with patients, help people. And uh, it's, a, it's a cognitive challenge. You have to be thinking and know your stuff. Okay. So it was a good fit for me. And um, what I happened with the ankle? I was uh, I was playing volleyball in high school and I came down on another player's ankle and inverted my ankle, oh. so an inversion ankle sprain, mm -hmm. which is the standard story. And the standard injury for that would be a lateral ankle sprain, which is what everyone thought I had. Uh, a couple MRIs later, a couple misdiagnoses went through. The MRI showed this little OCD lesion, osteochondral lesion on my talus, one of the bones in your ankle. So a little piece of bone had died in my ankle, but the whole time the doctors were thinking lateral ankle sprain, you can play on that, not an issue. It's, it's going to heal, just keep playing on it. And so I was doing uh, two sports at the time, soccer and volleyball, you know, going from volleyball practice to soccer practice in the same evening. And <laughs> Great for the ankle, like both sports like there. <laughs> Like, like I couldn't even jump off my ankle, but they could, they said, you're fine, man. You're not going to make it worse. And uh, yeah, I learned a lot from that whole experience with, with the, uh, the medical field, but mm -hmm. finally that was diagnosed properly. I got surgery and then lots of PT later, uh, I knew what I wanted to do. And you know, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you if probably if I hadn't had that injury and it hadn't worked out how it did. So uh, I'm grateful. Wow. It's, you know, it's interesting because I, Personally, I kind of had a similar thing. I had a slipped epithesis in my hip. My femur slipped out of the growth plate at 14 years old, which everybody thought it was a groin pull for the longest time. And it just was a groin pull that wouldn't go away until finally went to a good orthopedist and he just saw me walking and he's like, yep, did some x-rays and 
kind of just threw it up very nonchalantly. And it's like, see how that bones out there? It's supposed to be in there. So was we're going to go in today. What's that? Was this a skiffy? The slit capital femoral epiphysis? Yeah, that's it. Oh, very good. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So had to uh, roll in there from the morning. We're thinking you're just going to go in and get some stretches or some PT into later that afternoon, going into emergency surgery, saying, get off that leg before it completely slips out. And then was, uh, was on crutches for the next year or so, but yeah. it's a, uh, were you a larger kid at the time? I was. Yeah. So it's it normally happens in, I was big, but I wasn't like obese. Cause they, I looked at this and normally they, this happens with obesity in uh, young kids of a lot of hip problems, but what could have happened, they thought is because I was, I was diagnosed with leukemia at age three and from early onset chemotherapy could cause some brittleness in the bones they found out. So, or this night might've just naturally been a just growing thing that just comes up that nobody could have saw coming. And it just naturally just happened at one point, but luckily I had an amazing orthopedic team that, you know, saw it immediately when I went in and, you know, fixed it, but it was that good year and change of being off the feet that's going in. But it's one of those same things that shaped my mind into really loving the, the movement, you know, the movement side of training, not just the, the strength and building up, really understanding movement and function. That makes sense. And I assume that you're doing well with the leukemia diagnosis at this point. Uh, no more at risk. I think of anything else. I think that came out like five years ago. So yeah, knock on wood, but um, yeah, had had enough of the doctors in the world. So now I try to be in the preventative side as yeah, well, geez. you know, from there. <laughs> yeah, but it is, it's, it's interesting. I mean, the same story, like you said, it just kind of shapes our, our mindsets into some things that we're passionate about or what we want to do with helping people. So then you got into, then you got into the PT world then from there and went to, went to USC. Is that right? Yeah, I did a Pitt for undergrad university of Pittsburgh. So I stayed in the Northeast and then I bounced. I was completely over the weather out there and just being on the East coast. And I was like, opportunity came and I went to the university of Southern California. There you go. That was good. It was, it was a very good experience out there. Stayed there for three years for grad school. And uh, yeah, I made some great contacts out there and they were some of the people that inspired me to go down this path. Yeah. So going into this path then, like, I mean, I'm sure this was something that in your practice of being, you know, a DPT for a bit, is this something that you saw was just a need that wasn't being addressed or was there a specific thing that happened where you're like, we need to solve this problem? Yeah. Yeah. So it's funny. Um, if you go into a, a PT clinic that doesn't yet have a next level, you'll see some pretty interesting things. If someone is rehabbing their neck, uh, you know, if, if it's for the shoulder or for the hip, all the exercises look totally normal. You've probably seen them in passing. They're not embarrassing to perform, but if you are in the, the clinic, the PT clinic for neck pain, there is a high probability that you're going to be doing some funky looking, embarrassing, weird exercises. For example, some PTs will have patients like tie a resistance band around their head mm -hmm. and then they'll pull the resistance band away. And this is a way to make the neck muscles turn on and fire. Mm -hmm. Other patients will have to push their head into a big Swiss ball that's pinned against the wall as mm -hmm. another way to turn on the neck muscles. So it's just kind of a funny looking scene. And there's a bunch of exercises like that where it just didn't make a ton of sense that we couldn't be doing any better as a profession. Right. And uh, I was like, how has no one like kind of addressed this yet? Yeah, we are a young profession, but still like this is a little bit embarrassing. I wouldn't want to come here and be a, a neck pain patient. Uh, so that was, that was some of the inspiration. And, um, I had always wanted to do a little bit more. Like I, I, I knew I wasn't going to be a 40 hour in the clinic guy forever. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't going to happen. I, I always wanted a little bit more. I was more ambitious, whatever the, whatever the concoction was in my head. But I started prototyping right after I graduated PT school just because I was fed up with not trying anything different. Like my life to that point had been a very straight path. Like everyone knew what was going to happen. Like go to school, get my degree, start treating patients. And, and there's, that's great. There's, you know, there's, there's honor in that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just wasn't for me. Like I, I knew immediately I, I was going to get really bored or be unhappy. And I just needed some excitement, some challenge, something that I wasn't uh, good at. Right. Mm -hmm. So 
started prototyping. Everyone always asked me if I had an engineering background. No, not all. I could barely use a drill. Like I, <laughs> I, I, it's so funny to think back, like just putting holes in metal and like, you know, screwdrivers and learning the difference between a wrench and, you know, whatever else. Like it is, it's really funny thinking back mm-hmm. to the, the tinkering days in the garage. Oh yeah. Uh, but so, you know, the, the first prototype, like you said, that was a skateboard. So I, I literally just lied down on my back and, and put my head on top of a skateboard and the grip tape was all rough on the back of my oh, head. Oh yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> rough. I put a towel down to, to smooth that out a little bit and uh, turn my head back and forth mm-hmm. and just as a way to see if we could uh, stretch the neck in a comfortable position because we didn't really have any good ways to stretch the neck when, when mm-hmm. gravity is eliminated, when you're out of a weight bearing position. So you're on your back, mm-hmm. uh, supine, as we might say. So it felt great. Like I, I was like, wow, this feels pretty good. I was like, someone had to have invented this already. So you have to go through the, the prior art search as the patent attorneys call it, mm-hmm. where you search through all of the previous patent art and you're looking to see if anyone else has patented something similar or, you know, you should probably just stop right there if you find something that looks similar. All right. But surprisingly, no one had thought of a, a board that slides underneath your head, which again, like it didn't make any sense to me. It seems so obvious. Mm-hmm. And then uh, a PT recommended I add some resistance to it. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So it wasn't my idea to, to do the strengthening component of that mm-hmm. and uh, started going down that path. And that was when they like the quote unquote product market fit. Like I realized if this thing could both stretch your neck and strengthen your neck, boom, that is all you need in a device for treating neck pain in a PT clinic. You know, you got your hands-on treatment as a PT, your manual therapy, but then if you can add a one, one tool that can both stretch and strengthen your neck, it's all over. Wow. And uh, things just accelerated as soon as I saw the path. Okay. So your initial thoughts on this was more of a, um, a measure of stretching and more of like a rehab-based thing, but didn't really see it as much of a a strength or a preventative type program? Everyone in the world should be very happy that uh, it is not my orig- an original thought or my original design. Mm-hmm. Like the, the original patent is, is hideous. I can't believe that that was like <laughs> what was submitted. Uh, so yeah, it was not, the strength thing was not even in my head at the time, which is again, mm-hmm. ridiculous. And uh, yes, yeah, so we added some of the resistance bands and that was when the whole thing took off. Like it was like, all right, it took you about six months to figure out what to do, but now you know. Okay. How did it take off uh, from there? Was it just people who saw it just realized like this was a, a way to strengthen the neck? That's kind of where I saw from just looking at your stuff, Scott, is it seems like the neck is one of those things that nobody talks about until there's a problem there, where it's like, if you have neck pain or if you play a collision sport and you get hit and obviously concussions are a huge thing that are going on, which could, you know, be due to something like whiplash, which is a neck issue and stuff. But the preventative side of actually like training it, like a strength exercise is not something that's talked about. I know in the personal training and like the strength world, maybe in the high level where, you know, pro athletes are making millions of dollars, you know, thinking is a little bit different, but that was what I thought of like, yeah, nobody's looking at this as a, a strength and a prevention tool. Right. Right. And I was kind of thrown into that world by surprise. Like I thought, and I designed this to be for the PT clinic, for the chiropractic clinic, for someone with neck pain, but what has happened as a result of just being in the space of neck strengthening and and, and neck rehab where people either had rehabbed and wanted to continue using it because they like to strengthen their neck. It felt good. They felt better. Their posture was better. Their pain was less, whatever it was. And then all of a sudden I'm in like i I'm, I'm direct messaging like formula one drivers who mm-hmm. they don't have any neck pain per se, but they have incredible demands on their neck, maintaining their head in the right spot as they're whipping these formula one cars around. Shout out to Antonio. He, uh, okay. he actually just got a, uh, he just got me connected with one of the Ferrari drivers. So one Oof. of the Ferrari drivers now has a, a next level. I uh, don't know if he's using it yet. They're so darn busy. The season just started. So Mm -hmm. I'm still trying to connect with the performance coach, but yeah, uh, things are great. Yeah. Yeah. So the strengthening component of the device was a surprise. I I was not intending for that, 
But there's this kind of weird limbo in between uh, neck pain and then uh, the pro preventative or prophylactic neck strengthening. And the funny thing is like most people, I don't know if I can say most, but a good portion of people have neck pain at some point in their life. So mm -hmm. it's not like uh, the shoulder or the elbow or the wrist where people don't really care if it, say you don't have wrist pain, like you don't really care about make, doing wrist exercises. But if mm -hmm. you don't have neck pain, like you might still be interested in strengthening your neck, like you said, for performance, for concussion mitigation, for uh, whiplash mitigation, all that stuff that you'll see in, in the contact sports. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. You said that about formula one, I'm going to go back to that. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, of tension for, for neck strength in formula one. Oh my gosh. You should, uh, you should watch the drive to survive series by Netflix really? on the formula okay. one. It's, it's fantastic. So basically whenever you see the formula one drivers training, mm -hmm. they are doing neck strengthening exercises and it's pretty barbaric. Some of the stuff that they're doing, like they'll do bridges where their head is supporting their body yep. weight. Mm -hmm. If you know what I mean? Yep. They'll have, um, cables around their head, around their head. And then their performance coach will be pulling basically as hard as they can trying to get their head to fall out of center. And it's necessary because they're seeing five G's of force when they're whipping around turns or decelerating from 220 miles an hour to 30 miles an hour to cut around a corner. Yeah. So yeah, they have tremendous demands on their neck and it's uh, it's pretty insane. Yeah. That makes, now that thinking about it, that makes sense. Cause they're so strapped in like for their body. Cause you think like, if you take a, just a turn at like a little bit too, um, you know, too fast, you feel your body shift where those guys, they prevented that, but there's nothing on the neck that's holding them in that same position. So yeah, just that force of turning. Yeah. You can see that work. Wow. I never even thought of it that way. And you got that big, heavy helmet on top yeah. of it, which just makes matters worse. It's the same thing with football, right? Mm -hmm. The demand on the neck only increases when you put something on top of the head. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. A while ago, I talked with a guy, uh, his name's James Fuller, who is a, he's like an encyclopedia of old time strongman training. So the stuff that he puts out is very interesting and kind of odd lifts for training. But the stuff that he did with like neck bridges and talked, that was a little bit, we talked about neck strength of building that up. He said that was one of the things that like cured some issues that he had in his T-spine and thoracic spine by just building the strength up in that position. So, um, you know, the first time I saw somebody doing any type of neck exercise was a guy in an old gym and he had one of those concoctions where he puts on his head, kind of put it on the cable machine and is kind of just turning his head. And it does, it, it looks kind of weird and funky. And I didn't know he did amateur wrestling at the time, mm -hmm. but then he kept doing it after he was done just because he said it felt, you know, so good. So I think it's almost like that neck work seems like you said, like it looks a little bit weird, but it seems like as soon as people feel the benefits of it, it's something that they're probably not, you know, taking out of their program anymore. No, no. Yeah. People, people enjoy it and it feels good. It's, it's funny. Like everyone has felt like fatigue in their biceps or their quads or whatever from some exercise or walking up the stairs, carrying something heavy, but you really haven't felt your neck muscles burn until you've done an exercise specifically tailored for them. And it is a, it's a desirable feeling. You, you come out of that and your neck feels nice and supported. Like, like all the muscles are just giving your neck a big hug after you, you turn on the, the region and, and get mm -hmm. things going. Okay. So how does it work? It, like it's a board that you, like you pretty much you're on and then it's, you're sliding back and forth and you said there's resistance on it. Like how much resistance is usually on there that you people use? Yeah. So we use uh, the, just a resistance band system and it's color graded. So in the PT world, it's yellow, red, green, blue, mm -hmm. and then there's black and gray for the elite neck strengtheners. And, uh, it's, uh, it's, it doesn't sound like a lot of weight and it's going to range from two to 10 pounds if you elongate the band a hundred percent. So if you double its length, it's going to be up to two to 10 pounds of resistance. But the, there's a rotational component to this board, uh, given that your head's on top of it. So your head wants to turn uh, when there's resistance applied. So the numbers don't really seem to equate to the effort level required. Uh, if I were to tell someone this is only two pounds, they'd be quite surprised because they it takes a lot of effort. So mm -hmm. I, I try not to think too much about the uh, the exact pounds of force. Right. And it's more about the experience 
and then how their form looks. So a lot of patients can't go above that first yellow band because their form falls apart. Okay. What's the response usually like with people when they first get into it? Is there some apprehension um, in it or is it usually like they get into it and it, it seems like just, okay, we're just doing a different type of therapy exercise? Well, you know, it's new, right? Mm-hmm. So you look yeah. at it and people don't know what it is. They don't know how it's going to work. They don't know what's going on. And once they realize that it's not, it's a non-powered tool, right? It's not going to move their head for them. It's only going to move if they want to move. Then it's smooth sailing from there. Like patients have no fear or qualms about using it once they start turning their head. It's it's a pretty smooth experience. One of the design challenges for me was uh, making that board buttery smooth as it slides back and forth. Mm-hmm. Like it is, uh, if you just tap it on one end, it'll just gr- graciously, uh, uh, beautifully slide across the whole channel and then get to the other side without slowing down. Just smooth, smooth, smooth. So you know, people with neck pain, they you know, you don't want to put anything strenuous into their program immediately. You want it to be comfortable. You want them right. to be able to relax because a lot of times it's the big superficial muscles, the ones on the outside that you can see that are tense and they're potentially pain generators. And uh, we want those big guys to relax. And it's the deep little muscles that we want to get working. So right. the next level is nice because they can relax all those big boys and then get the small guys working before we add a lot of strengthening. Gotcha. Okay. Why is it, it seems like this is like such a new thing that people don't talk about as much. Is it just that people are, do you think that it's just like the industry has just been scared to kind of work with the neck just because there's, I mean, it's just these little vertebrae that are so close to this, you know, brain that we have, which is the only one that we have. It seems like everybody has a million different, you know, talks about upper body work and power, or even like knees. I worked with orthopedics with ACL prevention, and there's a million different ACL prevention protocols and ways, you know, to come about that. But still, it's like, it seems like this is the thing that everybody should be working with more because there's some really valuable real estate, like right above that. But it still seems like there's not much out there. Do you have a philosophy or a theory about why nobody's really attempted to, to go deeper into this? I think there's an upswell in interest that's Mm -hmm. been growing in the last decade, perhaps. Um, We've identified that concussions are a tremendous issue in youth athletes. And as a result of that, I think the next stage was like one, figuring out what's going on with concussions and then two, treatment and how to prevent them. And then I, I think the medical field realized, well, there's probably a big role here in the neck. And so I think there is some interest in the neck growing through that, through mm-hmm. the concussion world. I can tell you in the, in the history of physical therapy, it has commonly been avoided strengthen, strengthening the neck. And I think generally in the rehab world, uh, there hasn't been a large focus on putting those neck muscles under tension or under stress. I think there is some, some worry that we would do some damage, which is, is kind of funny to think about it. I don't think there is any good anatomic rationale for why that Mm -hmm. was, but I think, like you said, I think it's just people are timid as they approach the head and the brain. Like I can tell you, even for manual therapy, like, um, like in PT or chiropractic, we'll, we'll, we'll pop some, some joints. We'll, we'll do manipulations. We call them. And everyone is super keen to do low back lumbar manips and then the thoracic spine, usually not a lot of tension or worry for the PTs to do so. But as soon as you get to the neck, there's only some of the courageous PTs or chiros that are doing neck manipulations Mm -hmm. and they're no less safe than all the other regions. It's just something about as you work your way up towards the brain, people get nervous. And uh, even in the neck, the, the lower cervical manips are more common than the upper cervical manips. Uh-huh. It's, it's just, there's some, some fear with all that stuff. Yeah. I think that played some, some role in it too. And um, I think the fact that grappling sports and MMA, UFC, all that stuff is growing in popularity, rugby, football, all that right. stuff is, is, is at the main stage right now. And a lot of those athletes are complaining of neck injuries. They're sustaining neck injuries. And so I, I just think that the spotlight has slowly grown to towards mm-hmm. the neck and the head over the last several years. So right. I hope that answers your question. And I think, no, I think that's great. It's, I know a few years back um, was when I was working with a team and we worked with an athletic trainer and his team and they started talking a lot about 
the concussion kind of like the epidemic that was going on of what was happening. And that's when they, we learned about the seven day protocol where you have to go through that in order to play. And then I know the NFL got huge into that with all the CTE, you know, work. And that's when I first felt like it was getting more into the mainstream media and trickling down into general populations. Is there a correlation between um, building neck strength or working this and helping prevent a concussion from happening? I'm not aware of if Mm -hmm. they've done a a neck strengthening program and then gone and watched to see if concussions occurred. I'm not aware of a study that has has looked at that. Mm -hmm. But what I can say is that they have done the studies where they look at neck strength and neck girth, they call it the circumference of your neck. Right. Have found that that is correlated with lowering the acceleration forces that your head would see in a whiplash event. So the stronger your neck is, the the better prepared you are from the bobblehead motion. Your head is going to be less like a slinky if you do have a stronger neck. So, you know, it's obvious, but they, they have proven that in the literature. I think we're still uh, early in the game as for direct uh, proof that building strength in the neck will prevent concussions. It just takes a while right. to, to bore that out in the literature. Yeah, that was thinking it's probably just really tough to get just right literature on that because if something's not happening, how do you know it would have happened before? I'm sure. So, you know, that's probably the, but it only makes sense, right? I mean, if you're strengthening something, then if something's going to happen, that is going to cause it to, you know, possibly like, you know, whip to the side and you're stronger there, then it's probably going to help prevention. It only logically makes sense, you know, from there, but you know, just think, well, thinking of it from the neck percent, like a personal anecdote that I had, I remember I've, I went to chiropractics for a long time and had some really good ones, but I went to one that really kind of fucked with my head because it was a new person I was working with, didn't really know me. And this chiropractor, this woman like put the position of me and kind of cracked my neck. And the, the sound of that I heard from my neck, just, it was like a, you know, and it freaked me out for like weeks afterwards of just that <laughs> feeling, you know, because it is, it's like right there. So, you know, I'm just thinking like, just, I know, like, even if somebody does that, I remember that to this day of like, there's a little bit of a threat feeling to that. So that's maybe one of the the reasons why maybe it's pe- some people don't talk about it as much or work with it as much, um, you know, with the cervical spine as they would like the, to the T-spine or the lower back. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I think, I think you're onto something in that the ears are very close to the neck. And so when it cracks, you hear that very acutely. (laughs) Yeah. So when did you, when did you see this first start to, to kind of um, take place? I know you had the the prototype with it, then a PT told you to kind of add the resistance to it. Um, Were you keeping it in the PT kind of world? Because I know, you know, you've had some work with, you know, Formula One with other professional, um, you know, organizations as well. When did that start to take off, you know, with this? Yeah, so it all can be traced back to around the timeline of the COVID initiation. So right as COVID was coming in March 2020, I had uh, gotten all the things said, everything was in place to send out 10 uh, prototypes that I had spent way too much money on because it wasn't an efficient build. And uh, they were ugly, herky-jerky prototypes, but they worked. And I was like, okay, here's the introduction to physical therapy clinics. And then everything shuts down, which was a very uncertain time Mm -hmm. period for everyone, including the PT clinic, which the majority of clinics closed for at least some period of time, Mm -hmm. maybe some transition to telehealth, maybe some didn't. But right as the clinic closed down, I was like all gung-ho to get these things sent out. And then boom, uh, that stalled. So uh, as the clinic slowly came about, uh, PTs weren't, as my friends in the PT mm-hmm. industry, weren't as busy because patients weren't, weren't coming back in. So it was actually the perfect time to get devices into the clinic because I could train everyone on how to use it. Their patients started to trickle back in. They had a little bit more free time because, you know, you talk to the average PT and they're just bombarded all day long with patients and trying to write notes and yeah. keep a, just keep their head above water. And so it was, it was amazing timing actually, because I got the devices into all the clinics. They had time to onboard it. They had time to actually think about it and use it with a few patients before they were slammed. And mm-hmm. the feedback was positive. I mean, the, the most exciting moment, I think ooh, it's debatable, but one of the most exciting moments was when my friend Graham Gage, shout out a PT from USC. Uh, he said that his patient loved it. She attributes her improvement to the product 
And this was the old ugly prototype. And she said, and she wants to buy one. And I was like, what? No way. Like I couldn't <laughs> believe it. I couldn't believe it that it one, it had helped someone to that degree and, and two, that they wanted to purchase it. Mm-hmm. Um, and she, uh, she became the first patient that bought one. Uh, okay. And then I eventually got her the, the good model so that she could, she could use that one. But that was when I felt like I was onto something. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just a slow process to improve the, the actual design of the product, uh, you know, day at a time, uh, one little change at a time. I use a lot of 3D printing so that I can rapidly uh, uh, prototype and, and improve the design mm-hmm. uh, without really any risk because it's just a change in the code and then boom, you can print it again in a few hours. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so, you know, as the, as it matured, uh, I was, everything was still locked down on the internet. You couldn't find it on the internet. Um, but I was about to launch. And at that time period, I was uh, meeting with PTs and athletic trainers, and I got a couple emails out to pro sports teams. Uh, mm-hmm. So some local teams for me, uh, NFL teams like that. And, uh, you couldn't look at the website yet, but I, I like sent them some pictures and some mm-hmm. videos, and they're like, wow, this looks interesting. Yeah, we'd be happy to, to trial it. Like, we agree. There's some room for improvement in this area. And so, you know, a month goes by and I'm like very eager to hear what's going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, get one of the guys on the phone and he's like, I think you got a winner here. And I was like jumping up and down. I can remember where I was. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's like just been a bunch of great moments like that where you, you realize you have product market fit. And, uh, you know, this, this idea, this stupid idea has became a, a legitimate product that seems to help. Yeah. Well, it seems like it's, it's so just looking at how it works, it just seems so easy for anybody to worry. That was going to be my question. Like, is this something that is just best for like a physical therapy practice, or is this something that a consumer can have, uh, you know, in their home and really work or is this something like that can be in any gym or, you know, kind of, uh, even like high school, like in their area and stuff. Cause I think that's where, like, it just seems like with, uh, with youth athletes who a lot of kids are getting away from sports like football or hockey because their parents don't want their kids to be getting into concussions, you know, from there. So to have this in all these areas to show like there's a preventative measure of it, I think is only the next logical step that it hopefully just continues to grow. I agree with you. I hope, I hope you're right. Uh, yeah, the, the consumer is a very exciting market, right? So currently it's, it's priced at a point where usually the consumer doesn't want to reach for it. It's priced for PT clinics and pro sports teams. Uh, mm-hmm. I am so excited that eventually there will be a consumer model that someone with neck pain can find this on the internet and mm-hmm. uh, they'll be able to help themselves. You know, it's kind of like having a PT clinic at your own house, right? So it's all the yeah. exercises that we would do and then the challenge that's going to be interesting for me to solve is how to train them, uh, which exercises they do, how much do they do? Is mm-hmm. there interpersonal contact between this customer, this, this consumer and, and a PT, or is it just uh, some training videos online? Mm-hmm. All that stuff is uh, to be seen, uh, to be determined, but it's going to be fun to develop that, that training and um, see if I can remotely help patients in the same way that I can in person. Yeah. I'm wondering too, like you said, cause so many people experience neck pain at some point and, you know, now, especially since COVID, but it's been going on even before that so many people are working from home now. Like I know, like from their computer position, you know, with just that neck kind of forward, you know, into the screen, which can cause so much issues with the neck. Like this just seems like it's, it seems like it's a, it's a great tool for like physical therapy, but I think just this, just the more we talk about this, this is just something that needs to be just in a general population and use more. And just that, just the awareness of neck training is kind of like, I had this guy Graham Tuttle on a little while ago and all we talked about was the foot. It's like the foot is one of those other things that seems like nobody talks about like foot health. It's our connection to the earth. You should learn how to run barefoot first, as he says, before you even start talking about you know, shoes, you know, you can do it in a small position and setting, but knowing how to spread your toes, it's the same, like, it's the same type of thing before you figure out what's the best shoe to go on a, uh, you know, on a 5k. It's the same thing here with the neck. It's like, learn how to get the full range of motion and actually strengthen your neck. You know, it's from interesting there. too. I, my, my brain went to like, uh, teach someone how to tackle before you give them a helmet. 
right? Yeah. Like the uh, like the rugby players. I think it's pretty much agreed upon that they have the best tackling form. Right? Mm-hmm. They're not leading with their head. They're able to use their their chest and their shoulders properly. And yeah. uh, sure, they come up with their bloody nose and bloody forehead every once in a while, but. I don't think they're leading with their head. There's no, there's not a problem with spearing like there is in the NFL. Right. uh, Yeah. I mean, obviously in the NFL, they've cracked down on the people that are leading with their head for tackles. But the problem for them was it is such an effective weapon to to lead with their head and just jam that thing into someone's chest or wherever. Well, and no one talked about, I think, what the helmet actually prevents. And it seems like really the helmet, what it does is prevent lacerations. Like it's not really, it's not helping you in the neck. It's not helping your brain, like your brain's sitting in that matter. So all it's doing is, you know, making sure that, yeah, probably you're not like cutting yourself and bleeding out of your head from there. But (laughs) like, other than that, like you said, like with, you know, thinking back to like the formula one, like that's a heavy freaking helmet that's on the top of your head. And you know, we've seen the charts before, like just changing the angle of your head, the weight of it starts to change drastically, you know, over and over again from there. So it's, it's one of those things that I think we think that the helmet does more than it actually, and that it actually does in preventing things. Yeah. And I think like a bike, bicycle helmet too, there's a, there's a compression or a cushion to it, kind of like an airbag within the helmet. So mm-hmm. I do think there's some attempt to uh, decrease the the brain rattling as there is a, a contact with the with the head on the ground or wherever. The other thing that is funny, I don't know if you have seen this yet. It just feels a little bit backwards to me is that there um, there is this system that goes on top of a helmet. So you put on your big hard shelled helmet at a football practice, and then on top of that you can put on this kind of like an airbag thing. So it's like on top of that, you have a soft surface. So that, in, that uh, absorbs the, the initial forces for practices just to not get those little micro concussive events mm-hmm. or micro traumas throughout practice because those are you know more preventable. And then they take that off for the game. So it just felt kind of backwards. Like, why are they wearing anything at all? If they don't want any head yeah. collisions, just don't wear a helmet. Like no one's going to hit their head, but they wear a helmet, <laughs> hard shell helmet, and then a soft softer uh, adjuncts to the helmet on top of that. And you can Google these things. I can't remember what they're called. Oh, right. I'm sure it, <laughs> it makes sense. It's logical. Like if you're going to wear, wear a helmet, wear that. But I mean, it just feels kind of backwards, the whole thing. Yeah. That that seems like it's on the same line, like when they started trying to use weighted basketballs in order to get stronger and then realize it screwed everybody's shot up because it's such a finesse-based movement and you don't need crazy strength in order to shoot a three-pointer. It's like, you just need to practice your three-pointer. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that doesn't make any logical yeah. sense to me, but they do have the, uh, the heavy, the weighted uh, baseballs, right. They will make those heavier. And I think that is effective. For- they do. They do. Uh, I've, I've worked um, just a little bit with, uh, with some minor league stuff and who's with pitchers. And, you know, they said they do that in many ways, but it's, it's, I think it's more of a warm up based tool that they use and maybe like some long talk. If somebody's training out there in baseball, please, you know, correct me if I'm wrong on that. But you know, the, the, the kind of airbag kind of bubble wrap thing on top of the helmet just seems like it's a little asset. Well, it's one of those things, right? It's like, we're, we're trying all the time to make these things safer, you know, right. It's like, what can we do to make these things safer? It's like, if you're going to play football, there's going to be some sort of risk that's going to go on. So it's better to look at inventions like you're doing of how can you make yourself more resilient and more strong? You know, it's like the, you know, if you look at the computer world, it's like there's viruses that are coming in at us all the time. Like we don't try and kill every virus. We make the system more robust so we can get rid of it. It's like, that's what we should be doing with the body. It's like, don't try and make these things safer than they need to be. It's like, it's no, just make the body more strong and more resilient. If you strengthen the neck up and probably practice without a helmet, I would bet that that would probably solve a lot more problems than trying to, you know, wrap the helmet in bubble wrap and, you know, putting some, (laughs) putting some kind of false sense of security into practice. Yeah, for sure. I I think you'd find uh, this interesting as well. There's some technology out there. I don't think it caught on, but I know it made it to the NFL. There was a, there was a player on the, the Panthers that used this at least one game and he had it around his neck. It's this little collar that squeezes your jugular veins. So your jugular veins are uh, what takes the blood out of your brain and your head and goes back towards the heart. So your big jugular veins, it was this device that would push on them and cause a backlog in blood in your brain. Now, why is that a good idea? 
they looked at um, woodpeckers, birds that smash their head against a tree all day. And they thought, how do these birds not have concussions? Like, how do they not have brain damage? They're just smashing their head all day. Mm -hmm. And what they figured out was that they have some type of system where their veins will in some way compress and build pressure within the skull, within the cranium, so that the blood swells around the, the noggin. So the brain doesn't rattle around as much when, mm -hmm. the, the, when the head is bashing back and forth. So you can imagine if it's a nice tight system in there, the brain won't rattle and perhaps less damage to the brain. That mm -hmm. was the theory. So they developed this little collar that goes around your neck and it just squeezes your neck and potentially increases the, the jugular vein pressure or potentially just your blood pressure within your skull. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thought was that that would prevent brain rattling in the same way. <laughs> it didn't catch on. And I don't know if it was effective, but I, I mean, at least we're thinking, you know, you well, yeah, can't that, wow. <laughs> wow. That is a, that seems like a barroom napkin type, uh, you know, just solution to something there of like, yeah, let's just inflate the head with like as much blood as I, I read that before, isn't it? I don't know if it's some sort of woodpecker or something else, but they have like a tongue that can actually like is so long or it can extend out that it like wraps around the brain in some way when it's like, you know, hitting something. It's like they're designed to do those things, right? It's like, maybe we're not designed to be like a woodpecker and there's nothing like that. Maybe it's, we need to just prevent hitting each other in the head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I think you're right. I think there's an inherent risk when you go into combat sports that, mm -hmm everyone should be aware of. And I, I'm not sure we should be putting so much focus on uh, being able to eliminate these things and, and, and labeling the sports as bad for the, for the human or, you know, bad for our culture because it's violent and people get injured. Like that is like what they're signing up for. Like these NFL athletes know the risks now and they're still right. willing to do it. I think most dudes who are athletic would be willing to be an NFL player knowing the risks, right? Like, yeah, uh, it's a, it's a, it's so, it's so amazing what they're doing and the contracts are so big that who wouldn't sign up for that at risk of some head injury. Yeah. I mean, and I think this is kind of, there's, you can have a debate about this in almost anything. You know, I've been in the kettlebell world for a long time and have had so many people who have said how kettlebells are bad for the back or like it's, it's caused these injuries and stuff. It's like, you know, the kettlebell is just a tool. It's like how you use it and how ready you are to do a certain thing is going to be completely, you know, different and dependent. If you have a right system and you do it properly, like a kettlebell swing is safer than almost any other type of movement when done properly. You're not popping off the ground. There's no impact on the joints that's going on. But if you, you know, like anything, if you're irresponsible with it, or if you're, you know, doing something that you shouldn't be doing at that time, then there's going to be a risk that goes into that. So instead of adding just more kind of safety tools of, of getting in, it's like, just focus on building more strength and resilience of it. And, you know, it seems like something with the neck too, it seems like it's, it's almost like we don't think of it as much until there's a problem with it. And then probably I'm sure like people who are using next level, once they realize how good this is like, yeah, they're going to keep this in their program afterwards uh, because they know how important it is. But it's almost like sometimes we just have to go through these things first to, you know, to get a taste of it. And then we just never go back. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. There, there are so many of my patients, regardless of if it's the neck or not, that once they've had an injury, they are so mo motivated to prevent it from ever coming back that they'll just keep on their program. They are gung ho on doing whatever they can to prevent that thing. And so they fall in love with their exercise programs and that is the way to go. Mm -hmm. And then going back to your point on the kettlebell being dangerous it's funny because like, would those same people say that the barbell is dangerous? Because I'm sure that a barbell has taken out far more people's backs or knees or even, uh, you know, necks or chest as a result of a bench press injury. Like the barbell is just as unsafe as the kettlebell, perhaps more unsafe if you look at total injuries. So mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it, like you said, it's just a tool and it can be used properly or improperly. I like you, I love the kettlebell. I think it's a, a fantastic training tool, like 40 pounds of kettlebell versus 40 pounds of barbell. My glutes could be shredded tomorrow if I use the kettlebell, but not the same if I use the barbell. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think still it's, it was for a while. And I think it still is like the number one cause of injury in a different modality of training is still yoga. It's like, and yoga is a great thing to do, but what happens in yoga, you 
are stretching beyond sometimes the limits of where you can control because you're increasing mobility and then poles and everything like else like that in static work, you know, that happens. So it's like anything, I think that it's, if you're, if you're building it properly and doing it right. And with something in regards to the neck, you know, it's an area that we don't strengthen as much. So you don't need that much resistance. Like you said, like you said, two pounds might be, you know, a lot, like be perfect, just amount, uh, just the perfect amount. Like I had Monica Bolt on the other day and we were talking about Indian clubs and Indian club work for, uh, you know, prevention and uh, range of motion and coordination, like one pound, uh, you know, Indian clubs, as you get farther and farther away, starts to increase in that resistance. You don't need, you know, five pounds or even 10 pound clubs. You can do one or two pounds and that's going to give you everything that you need in the shoulder. So it's all, it's all relative from here, but I think, you know, the conversation that we're talking about with the neck, I think it's, if we can get anything is don't be afraid to strengthen your neck and working on this. I think it'll only, you know, increase the resilience that you have in your body. And if you're playing a sport like football or hockey or soccer, like a collision based sport, then this should really be just like the norm of warming up and doing your sprinting and running just like anything. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that people will find that if they do a strengthening program for their neck, the aches and pains that they also have going on within their neck or their cervical spine will also evaporate. So, you know, there's like a multifaceted improvement that you'll feel in both performance and symptoms when you, when you're training the, the right region. So I agree. Uh, I, I just got into jujitsu uh, three months ago now, and uh, I've never been a, a combat sport guy. I've never done anything grappling oriented. I've always been like a ball sport dude. And uh, this has been the most amazing journey because you are using your head and your neck as like a fifth limb, like you are posting or you're like putting your head down on the mat and then you freeze up your arms so you can use your arms and you have like a tripod support between your feet and your, and your forehead. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you know, the way that people are trying to tap you out or submit you is often by wrapping their arms around your neck and yeah. choking you out. So my neck is going through unbelievable amounts of stress and stress strain and, and torque, force. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've never seen anything like this. And I had some neck issues going into jujitsu and those have all been highlighted since starting. And so mm -hmm. luckily I've gotten myself to get on a, a rehab program and actually use my own product. And it's definitely mm -hmm. been helping, which is, you know, kind of hilarious that it took yeah. me until starting jujitsu that I would actually use it properly. But it's really interesting. You know, the, the neck is, uh, it's kind of underlooked, but I think as we've been talking about, it's, it's coming into the, the spotlight and it's mm -hmm. going to be exciting to see where it goes. Like, I, I don't think there's a great way to strengthen the neck yet. If you're standing, like I, mm -hmm. I would argue that we, we've now have a good way to do it when you're lying down quadruped right. prone, but I don't think there's any great ways to, to do it standing, which is something that PTs want because it's a more of a quote unquote functional position. And we're all about function in the PT world. So mm -hmm. I think it'll be interesting to see how neck strengthening matures. I think there's going to be new products coming out down the road that are uh, used in standing or sitting. Yeah. And uh, I think. Do you think that, do you think that too? Do you think that like it needs to be standing? Because I don't know, it just seems like if everybody's working it in a, like a supine position or prone, like then like you're getting everything that you need from that position. It will probably translate into when you stand up. That's my bias. I yeah. completely agree. It's like bench pressing, like, right? Like, why do you need your pecs to be strong when you're lying on your back? No, yeah. they'll be strong for whenever you use them because of how you train them on your back. You know, that's, yeah. that's my thought process. Yeah. Yeah. But Well, uh, it is. It's, it's natural. I mean, it's a good thought process, right? To always think of a, uh, a you know, better way to do things, you know, from it. But it, it seems like as we're talking about here and what you've designed here, Scott, like if everybody gets on a work, a program like this and, you know, gets into the range of motion work and strengthen their neck from a lying down position, I would, I would bet that when everybody stands up and start moving, that strength is going to, is going to carry over into that. So, um, I think it's great. Like I said, I, this is a, this is such a fascinating, um, you know, area that's not talked about enough. So to see guys like you who are, you know, leading the way and inventing, you know, new things like this to, you know, to shed some light on it. I think it's awesome. So um, I hope this keeps spreading for you and keeps, uh, keeps this massive success going.
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's still early, but uh, all signs are pointing towards uh, a good outcome. So we shall see. Awesome, dude. Uh, Well, I really appreciate the time. This has been awesome, man. I'm going to have to have you back on and just see the progression of this as we go on and uh, and keep chatting on it. If people want to know more about uh, what you're doing with Next Level, you know, I can consume more of your content. What's the best place that we can direct them? Yeah, the uh, the Instagram is at Next Level. Uh, it's spelled N E C K S L E V E L, uh, not Next like N E X T. It's like with the neck, so it's a play on words. Uh, so Next Level on Instagram, uh, nextlevel.com is the website, and uh, my LinkedIn profile you can find is Scott Dickinson. Uh, I post on all of those things regularly. We have a YouTube channel as well. So there's many ways you can get in contact with us. And uh, if you want to email me, email is scott at nextlevel.com. Awesome, man. Good. Scott, again, thanks so much for your time. This has been great. Um, you know, like I said, this is, this is shedding a light on an area we need to talk, to talk about more. So I really appreciate it. I'm honored to have uh, the opportunity to speak with you. Thanks for the platform. And uh, it was great working with you. Awesome, man. Good. Listeners, if you want to check out more of Scott's stuff, you know where to do so. And I'll catch you on the next one. Peace. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you like the show, please give it a five-star review, give it a thumbs up, all that good stuff. And if you want to get the inside scoop on all new episodes coming up, behind the scenes insights and free training resources, then you can join the Strength Connection private Facebook group now. Just go to Facebook groups, type in the Strength Connection and join in. Also, don't forget to subscribe. See you soon.